by his words, all became. He set the galaxies into motion, aligning everything according to his will. The great conductor orchestrating the heavens, always advancing, ever moving through time and space. 2,000 years ago, he directed the stars and earth together to point to the center of his purpose. A child delivered in Bethlehem, the God of the universe wrapped into the tenderness of a baby. To us, a child is born, a son is given, our Savior has come. Well, Merry Christmas, everybody. It's so great to have you here on this morning, Christmas morning, and so good to see everyone. I remember when I was growing up back in the 1800s, uh, we had Christmas, and we would uh, go to Christmas every single Christmas, no matter what day of the week it was church. It was interesting how it used to be. My grandparents used to come over. Isn't it amazing how Christmas is almost like one big Christmas. I know it is for me sometimes. You know, I think when I was a little kid opening my G.I. Joe headquarters, remember, remember that? And the Kung Fu grip. It was about this big, and, and I remember that, and I remember first hearing about Christmas as a child, and they said, well, let's tell the Christmas story first. Okay, hurry up, hurry up. I'll get to my presents. But I remember that happening when I was a kid. But I also remember the great times around the table. My grandparents were sitting there, and uh, we would sing uh, Tannenbaum, we'd sing that German version of O Christmas Tree and all those great traditions. But I also recognize that sometimes Christmas can be difficult as well. Because since it's one big long holiday, one big Christmas, when you come to Christmas, it's like you go, you're back at five years old, and if you're 50 years old or 30 years old or 20 years old or 15 years old, it all seems to run together, doesn't it? And, and, and really, there's an expectation. Christmas... You're supposed to be happy. Family's supposed to work. Everything is supposed to go the right way. But how many folks know it isn't always that way, is it? And so today we're going to be talking about from Christmas pressure to Christmas peace. From Christmas pressure to Christmas peace. And you know, you're in good company. We're going to look at this morning the scriptures, looking at the uh, Luke and talk about what happened to Jesus and how he was born. And you know, make no mistake about it, this is Silent Night, Holy Night. All is calm. No, it was not all calm, and it was not all bright. It was a dark time. It was a difficult time for Mary and Joseph trying to find a place to stay and her being an unwed teenager and all those types of things. Listen, it was not all as calm and all as bright. It was a difficult time. And in many ways, I look at the Christmas season from from Thanksgiving to Christmas and New Year's almost like a microcosm of what life's really about. So let's just look at it in a few moments. The, the Christmas season can be such a disconnect between what we expect and what we end up experiencing. Isn't that not true sometimes? Sometimes life is that way as well. Sometimes life can be... And what can happen is that Christmas can be like a microcosm of life. It, it almost seems like you have all these expectations, things are supposed to go well, and within this period of about 30 days or so, you go through the whole process of Christmas. It's almost like your life. You plan for your life, right? Then you have your life, <laughs> and then you think about your life. You begin to throw away all the wrapping paper of your life, and you're moving on to something else. In many ways, that's kind of like what Christmas is like, isn't it? You have to go shopping. You got to do this or the other. I go to people's homes. I got to see that uncle who I don't want to see. Everyone has a drunk uncle, right? Everyone has that crazy uncle at the table. Everyone has somebody that it just gives you a hard time. And so, you know, we have what it should be and what it is. What it should be and what it is. What do you do when what you think is supposed to happen doesn't? How do you move forward in the difficult circumstances? How do you move forward in general? And so we're going to look at that this morning because the Bible has a lot to say about that. Am I the only one that's hot up here? No, we're not. Woo, man. We should have hand out towels. Cornerstone sauna. All right, here we go. Let's, first of all, let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for the Christmas story and, and what you did for us 2,000 years ago. We ask you bless our time here this morning. 
that we'd hear your word, that we'd walk in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's go ahead and look at Luke chapter 2. You can follow along the scriptures or follow along with the screen. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census. And so they had to get, everyone had to register. Listen, there was a little bit of pressure here because Mary, Joseph's taking Mary. They're not even married yet, and she's pregnant. So you have to understand, there was a lot of shame and a lot of difficulty back in those days. Even though they knew it was God, even though they knew God was working in their lives, make no mistake about it, who else is going to believe that, right? And so they're heading back. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, his fiancée, who was now obviously pregnant. I've learned a lesson. You don't ask someone, are you pregnant, until it's obvious. Okay, just a little bit of advice to you. I, I've done that before. Oh, are you pregnant? No, I'm not. So, I mean, they got to be obvious, like walking like this and, and like, you know, have the stretch pants on. And then you can say, are you pregnant? But do not say, are you pregnant, until it's obvious, okay? This might be worth the whole message to some of you. All right, let's move on. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her first child, a son. Now, why does it have to say first child? Because she had more children after, by the way. Jesus had brothers and sisters. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. And, you know, it's interesting. Most historians believe that Jesus was probably in a cave. It wasn't a cute barn. It was actually a cave. And then interesting that he was laid, he was wrapped in strips of cloth. What happened after Jesus was on the cross? What did they wrap him in? Strips of cloth, right. And where did they put him? A cave. Where was Jesus born? A cave, more than likely, right? Strips of cloth. And he was in a manger, as we mentioned last night, if you were here. A manger is a feeding trough for animals. Jesus satisfied the ultimate sacrifice for us. Interesting to me. I am the bread of life, and where he is in a feeding trough. Think about it. Strips of cloth in a cave. God does nothing by accident, by the way. He'll use every hurt, every difficulty for his glory, even if it was not his plan. So when life hands you difficult sets of circumstances, what we need to do is take it in, keep our eyes focused on God. So there's no lodging for them. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them, they were terrified. I just, this blows me away once again, as we mentioned before. Here are these shepherds. Shepherds, not kings, though they do come later on. Not dignitaries, but shepherds. But the angel reassured them, do not be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. You know, sometimes before great joy can happen, great fear can happen. I think that's worth saying, that's worth writing down. Sometimes before great joy can happen, sometimes great fear can happen. Why? Because our life is being rattled. What we're used to and accustomed to is being changed. We're being stretched. Before a muscle can get big like this, you got to stretch it first. You, gotta get, you have to feel the pain before you have the gain. And sometimes what happens is before you can see the joy, there can be a little bit of fear. And so it's okay. Listen, it's not bad to be fearful. What's bad is if you let fear control you. A courageous person marches through fear to the destination of where they're called and what they're called to do. That takes courage. If there's no fear, you wouldn't need courage, right? And so these shepherds have courage. Mary had courage. There's a lot of people in the Christmas story that faced fear and answered it with courage and belief that God was going to lead them. And I want to encourage you through life, sometimes stuff's going to happen. Fear will hit you right in the face. But we look at it with courage and knowing that God is going to get us through. And so it goes, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today, Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him for this sign. You will find a baby, again, wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in the manger. Suddenly, 
the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. Everyone else is, sometimes life can happen. We get caught up in the moment. We take pictures. We do all that. And we don't stay in the moment. We don't treasure the moment. I want to encourage you, like Mary, is to keep the things close to your heart. Remember the times around the table. Remember the times with friends. Remember the times, situations. Or remember what God has done for you and cherish those times. Because you know what? It is a gift. People are gifts from God. And she treasured these things in her heart, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they have heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. So from pressure to peace, how do we do that? Well, first of all, I want to encourage you to do this. Law your expectations by raising them. <laughs> Does that make any sense? Lower your expectations by raising them. Well, what do you mean? What I'm saying here is this. Put less confidence in yourself and more in confidence in God in you. Put less confidence in people and more confidence in God. Put less confidence in your spouse or your children or your parents or your coworkers and put more confidence in God. Let me tell you the reason why. People will disappoint you. In fact, if you look yourself in the mirror, you will disappoint yourself. But why build your life on something and have high expectations for things that will fail you when instead you can jack up the house and change the foundation and put God there? And so lower your expectations of what you expect from people in life and, and raise your expectations by believing God. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. So we should get ready for that. So lower your expectations by raising. And what is that supposed to mean? Well, the Apostle Paul said this very clearly. He said, for we are the circumcision who worship God. Basically, he's saying, what he's basically saying, we're the believers who worship God. And back in those days, circumcision would mean that you were Jewish and you were following the law. Who worship God in the spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. This is how you lower the expectation. Lower the expectation of the flesh. And raise the expectation of what God is going to do. Though also I might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have more confidence in the flesh, I more so. And he goes on and talks about his pedigree, which is basically Ivy League universities of his day, the best education, the best religious uh, things are going on. He was the who's who in the religious zoo. I mean, the Apostle Paul had it all together. And he's saying, I count it all but rubbish. And, and the, the word he used which I don't want to use in a family service. All right, so that's what he said in the Greek. It was not a very nice, it's excrement, basically. I count it all excrement compared to God. And so he says, I have no confidence, have no confidence in the flesh. So the problem, we give too much confidence in the flesh and no confidence in the spirit of God in us. That, my friend, will get us in the area of disappointment. The Apostle Paul goes on later on and says this, but what things were gained to me, these I've counted as loss to Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as, again, rubbish that I may gain Christ. See, the Apostle Paul was at the pinnacle of the pinnacle. He was at the highest echelon in religious community. He had a, 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 it was a person of status, and he's saying all that stuff means nothing compared to Christ. Listen, if you and I will get a hold of that and understand that, stop looking for natural things to be supernatural and start accepting God to be your supernatural strength and power. If you build your life on things that will fail, you will always feel like a failure. But if you build your life on things that cannot be shaken, then you can be an overcomer. It's important to see that. It's important to have the long view, whatever we do. And the Apostle Paul talks about that. And, and be found in him, and not having an own, my own righteousness. You see, my own strength, which is from the law, but that which is through Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. You see, God, I don't have what it takes 
to deal with the situation at work. I don't know if I can go another day. I want to quit, but if I quit, I can't pay the bills. Father, I don't know if I can take any more to school. I know I'm supposed to finish school. I don't know if I can do any more. And God, what am I supposed to do? When you get to that point, you say, God, I need your strength. God, I need your strength. Oh, that sounds so cliche. Okay, let go and let God. Thanks a lot. That's going to help me out. Well, no, let me explain what I'm trying to say. What we're trying to do is lower the expectations of what you can do and raise the expectations of what God can do. Because nothing is too difficult for God. And the Christmas story is full of people that people had low expectations for. Shepherds, a poor peasant girl, right? Jesus growing up with his family. And yet those low expectations were shattered because God worked. He chooses the lowly. He chooses those who over, are overlooked. And the power of it, so he says here, the Apostle Paul, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death. Boy, that sounds like a great Christmas message. Being conformed to his death. But really, what is as true is this. Every day, Oswald Chambers says this, one of my favorite devotionals. And by the way, I really highly recommend it, my utmost for his highest. I've read it for many years. He said, every day we should have a white funeral. So here lies Eric Bucci. Today I die so Christ can live in me. And the moment I raise from the dead, I become a zombie. <laughs> An apocalyptic zombie movie. You know what I'm talking about? The flesh comes out, starts walking around. And, you know, when, you, when the dead raise and walk the earth, there's trouble. And so we need to be dead to ourselves and alive to Christ. And, and this is what the Apostle Paul is saying, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of suffering being conformed to his death. Not that I've already attained it or already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ has also laid hold for me. So God has given me something to look forward to. And what is that? Who I am in Christ and who I will be forever. Listen, if there's nothing else you get, the most important thing you can learn in life is to learn to know who you are in Christ and where you're going. If you're a believer in Christ, you'll both experience him now and forevermore. And in heaven, there's no pain, there's no difficulty. So we look towards heaven. See, if you aim for earth, that's all you'll ever get. If you aim for heaven, you get some heaven thrown in while you're going through earth. It's always best to take the high and go after Jesus and so understand that and, again, lower the expectations of yourself and raise the expectations of God in your life. So the second one is this, dwell and meditate on the promises. I heard this statement many years ago, and I've used it a lot. What God has showed you in the light, do not doubt in the dark. What God has showed you in the light, do not doubt in the dark. Whatever the last thing God told you to do, stick with it. Do not give up. So, dwell and meditate on the promises. What is that supposed to mean? What does it mean, dwell? Well, dwell would be like settling down. I'm going to make my abode here. I'm not staying in the hotel. I'm actually buying a plot of land, and we're going to build a house. We're going to dwell. We're going to live in this. When you have a dwelling, it's a place you live, it's a place your life focuses around. And so, to dwell and meditate. Meditate is something we don't really understand in Western culture too much. Very, very popular in Eastern culture. Meditation is thinking about something over and over and over again. Probably the best way to talk about meditation, I'll give you an example, is worry. When you're worrying, you're meditating. When you hear uh, the company is merging with another company, they're going to lay off 3,000 employees starting with, their, starting with their, the most recent employees and the top executives who make too much money. And you're wondering, am I the talking top executive that makes too much money, or am I the first one going to go? Now, what's going to happen when you, you hear about that? You're going to think about that layoff, and you're going to look at it from every angle. What happens at this? What happens at that? What happens at this? And if you're not careful, you can work yourself, you can lather yourself up when worry. My friends, worrying is meditation in a negative capacity. You think of everything wrong that can go. Instead, Dwell and meditate on the promises of God. Now, what's so great here is this. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told to them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. All throughout the scripture, Mary 
has an experience with God. And she says, let it be done as you said to me. She ponders. She remembers. She, she ponders them. Listen, what we need to do, my friends, is ponder the good. Think about the good. Dwell on the good. Dwell on the promises of God. And, you know, sometimes we, we're so busy taking pictures, sometimes it's best just to take, put the phone down and enjoy the company that's at the house. I mean, sometimes we're so busy taking pictures and playing on Facebook to people who we don't even care about, and the people we care about are not even talking to them. You're not even talking to them because you're putting things on Facebook. Why not cherish the moment? Why not enter into the moment and say, I'm going to cherish this. I'm going to cherish this. As I get a little bit older, it just happens to me. A little while ago, I went to my parents' house, and my children are there, and my wife's there, and my parents are there, and all of a sudden, I just take a moment. I take, I take a mental, an emotional snapshot. And all of a sudden, I realize, probably 15, 20 years from now, this scene will not be here anymore. And I, I have tears of joy and tears of sadness, but I'm taking, what am I doing? I'm treasuring these things. I'm treasuring what God has done. I'm treasuring God has given us each other. We need to treasure where we're at and think about what's good. And so Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. She pondered the wonderful blessings of God. She pondered what God did in her life because, let's face it, what she had to go through was not easy. The Bible even says to her when she first heard the news from the angel, it will pierce your heart. And so she understood the importance of pondering, of dwelling on things. And I love what it says in Philippians. It says, finally, brethren, whatever things, Philippians 4, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, that means you have to turn off the news. <laughs> There's nothing there, right? We're pure. Whatever things are lovely, whatever things are a good report, if there's any virtue, and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Meditate. You want to know what meditation is? It's worry, okay? So we just mentioned that. Now let's meditate on what's good. Let me think. What happens when I follow God at my workplace? What happens if God gives me creative ideas in the workplace? What would happen if I were me a blessing to my boss? What would be, happen if I was a blessing to my employees? What would happen if I was a blessing to my teachers? What would happen if God gave me creative ideas how to make this better? And you start meditating and thinking about all the good things. You know what that does? That encourages you. There are people out there that are black holes. As soon as you meet them, it's like there's a gravitational pull to despair. And you know, I think a lot of us know people like Pigpen from Peanuts. You know who Pigpen is? If you've seen the Christmas special, you know, the Snoopy playing the thing, and all of a sudden this guy with a bunch of cloud is called Pigpen. Wherever he goes, he brings a cloud. If you cannot get rid of the cloud, then remove yourself from the cloud and get into the cloud of the Lord in his presence. If someone is draining you and you can't change them, the best thing to do is say, I'm too busy to hang out with people that are going to drain me. I want to help you, but if you're pulling me down, I don't have time. Uh, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's a good report, think on these things. Meditate. Meditate on these things. Think of good things. Think positively. Think of what God can do in your life. The things which you've learned and received and heard and saw in me, these things do, and listen to this, and the God of what? From pressure to peace. The God of peace will be with you. There's a lot more we could say about this, about praying and supplication and asking God and thanking Him for what you need. But dwelling on the right thing is so important. What you dwell upon determines your well-being. Your dwell makes your well. And the well you drink from will determine your health. What you dwell on installs a well. And you drink from that well, you will become. So what you dwell upon determines your well-being. Make no mistake about it. You've heard it before. I know it's almost cliche, but it's true. It's not what happens to you, right? It's what happens in you that's so important. And, you know, another thing I want to help you with is this. What entertains you, trains you. What entertains you, trains you. Make no mistake about it. It, it does. And what it does is whatever you think about, whatever you're entertained with, because, you know, you, you come at the end of the day, you're, you're tired, you're you had a long day, you put your feet up in the ottoman, you're watching TV, and you just let yourself go. Do you know what they used to do to brainwash people? They'd get them over, they get them tired and, and weary, and then they would put images before them. And that's how you brainwash somebody. 
And what are we brainwashing ourselves with? What are we looking at? What are we looking at in our, maybe a lot of us don't even watch TV anymore. Most of us just YouTube and, right? We're on our devices most of the time. Okay, let's, what are you doing with your screen time? What kind of stuff is coming at you? Because what you dwell on becomes you. Lower your expectations, dwell and meditate on the promises, and whatever God says, do. And when they ran out of wine, man, big problem at a party, apparently. The mother at a wedding, a big deal. The mother and Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Okay, and Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have? Look how he talks this way. Please never call mom woman, okay? It's always mom. It's very disrespectful. But this is, this is the translation of the Greek, so they didn't do it right. He said, oh, dearest mom. Okay, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And the mother said to him, whatever he says to you, do it. Whatever God says to you, do it. Even if it makes no sense, do it. You know what I find so encouraging about this as a little side note? Jesus had no intent. My time has not come. Yet, what did Mary do? She grabbed a hold of Jesus. Jesus, please, intervene. And he did. Make no mistake, God answers prayer. Life is not, a, life doesn't just happen. Life is shaped by our prayers and our obedience to God. God has his sovereign will. But he also has his permissive will, which you and I can grab into and take down. And this is what Mary did. But whatever he says, do it. Lower your expectations by raising them. Dwell and meditate on the promises. And whatever God says, do and keep on keeping on. Do not give up. I love watching the Olympics and all sorts of personal uh, people that do incredible things. You know what they often say? I wanted to give up, but I didn't give up. I kept going. Often the difference between failure and success is the people who determine not to give up. Keep on going. Keep on doing the right thing. What's the last thing God told you I'm going to continue to do? You know, and let's not grow weary while doing good. For in due season, it doesn't say we might. It says we shall. I looked at it. I looked it up, by the way. And it says we shall. It's a very strong word, like a future fact. It's going to happen. It's like saying tomorrow the sun will rise. For in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. What is God telling you to do? Keep on doing what God's told you to do. It's all part of the process. You see, the difference between winning and losing often is not giving up. Winners are not whiners. If you find yourself making excuses why something can't be done, that's not the spirit of God. That's a complaining spirit. That's a spirit that would drain faith in your life. How many times I've asked people, oh, I, I, don't like, I don't like my job. Well, why don't you look? Well, there's no jobs out there. And every time you ask them, well, I mean, okay, do you really, really want to see change in your life? Don't make excuses. If you find yourself making excuses why something can't change, you're a whiner, and you're not being a winner. A winner believes God can do something for you. Listen, this is important. If you're around whiners, get away from them. If you can't change whiners, get away from them. What happens if you're with your spouse? Well, <laughs> then you start being, you start being nice. <laughs> if your spouse is a whiner, then you know what? Don't reciprocate with whining. When, let me tell you something. When throwing, someone throws a whining or complaining at you, it's like playing catch. If I throw a ball to you, what you do is you don't catch it. And you don't return it. And after a while, when someone has a play, it's almost like a dog that comes up with you with a little piece of toy, drops it, waits for you to throw it. If you don't do it, the dog will finally give up. Okay, now a cat is a different story. But a dog will give up. So what you need to do is you've got to stop throwing the ball. And, and to throw if so, an insult or someone's negative, don't reciprocate, just let it go. And so winners are not whiners. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death in sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. See, this is the issue here as we get ready here is this. 
Death, oh, where's your sting? So listen, understand something. For those in Christ, we have life now and life eternity. What that basically means is that what God has done for us is so impressive and so amazing, we need to focus on that. And when you realize oh, the worst thing that can happen is you die and you go to be with the Lord. Oh, that sounds kind of morbid. No, it's not morbid. Because we understand that the promises of God are true. And so for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. Notice it says the joy set, not the complaining set before him, not the whining set before him. He was honest with the Father. He told the Father how he felt. But he said for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Now listen to this, knowing that your labor is not in vain for the Lord. No one sees what I'm doing. God sees it. God sees you praying for your spouse. God sees you praying for your kids. God sees you praying for your friends at school. God sees what you do in secret. And everything you do is not in vain for God. And so we have to stop and realize that the pressure of Christmas and like the pressure of life can be changed. And how do we change it? These four things today is this. Lower your expectations of, your, of the flesh and raise them in God. Dwell and meditate on God's promises. And whatever God says, do it. And keep on keeping on and don't give up. That's the Christmas story. They didn't give up. And because they didn't give up, they had an amazing time in Christ. So, steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Oh, death is where is your sting? He's saying, I have nothing to worry about. But if you're not in Jesus Christ, there is a sting of death. There comes a time where you're going to have to give an account for your life. And the truth is, I don't have what it takes, and neither do you. No one does. But Jesus has what it takes. And because he has what it takes, you and I can have what it takes to stand before God. And so this Christmas, are we going to be like the in? Keepers, would it make no room for Christ? Or are we going to open our lives and say, God, come into my life and grow in my life? Let's bow our heads. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you so much for what you've done for us on the cross. I want to thank you for Christmas. I want to thank you, Father, that you came in a way that blew everyone away. You didn't come with an army. You didn't come with a hostile takeover. You came humbly as a baby to a poor peasant girl and you changed the world father we thank you for that and we thank you that those who are in christ are a new creation lord i just pray you bless everyone here today lord i pray for those that are going through difficult times and are full of pressure but lord i also pray you talk to everyone right now who does not know you has not given their life to you father i pray you would touch their hearts even right now in jesus name if you don't know for certain, if you were to die today, you would be with God in heaven. You don't really know why. Well, I'm a pretty good person. I'm like everybody else. It doesn't do it. You have to accept what Jesus Christ has done for you on the cross. Believe in him. Place your trust in him. And you will be saved. Not because of your merits. Not because of what you have. Because of what he has. And that's such good. That's the good news. He, done it. he did it for us. So all I have to do is receive it and stay in it. So I'm going to pray right now. I'm going to just bow your hands. I'm going to pray right now. If you pray this prayer and mean it from your heart. Today can be a new day for you in Christ. Lord Jesus, I thank you for coming to the earth as a baby, for living a sinless life. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross. And I believe you rose again from the dead. I ask you right now to forgive me of all of my sins. And I choose this day to follow you all the days of my life. Holy Spirit, now fill me and give me the power to walk your way in Jesus' name. Let me ask you a question today with every head bowed. Say, many people say, Pastor, I, uh, I prayed that prayer today. Anyone say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer today? Just quickly put your hand up. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Good. Praise God. A couple people that just 
Are we asking God to come in their lives? And if you could look up real quick. Look up real quick if you could. There's a connection card in your seat pocket in front of you or in the worship guide. We want to encourage you to fill that out. It says, today I'm recommitting my life to Christ. Or I want to be baptized. We're going to have another baptism again next quarter, okay? Probably sometimes, I'm not going to say when, but we're going to have it soon. And we'd love to have you get baptized and proclaim your faith. But I encourage you, I'm committing my life to Christ. You can do that. And I also want to encourage you that if you have something, a prayer concern or something, you fill that out. So go take a moment right now and do that. We're going to take an opportunity to give back now to our tithes and offerings. If you're a guest, do not feel obligated to give. This is for folks that call Cornerstone Church their homes. And we, the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. So freely you have received, now freely give. So I want to encourage you with that. So, Father, we thank you for this offering today. We ask you to bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead, ushers, if you could be so kind to do that. Listen, I want to encourage you that next week, uh, next week's the new year. Can you believe that? And, uh, and we're going to be starting a new series, and we're going to have Growth Track, and I want to encourage you to come to Growth Track. Growth Track is something our church has. We have four classes every month. We're starting the second Sunday of January this month. Also, I want to let you know something else. We're coming up to 21 days of prayer and fasting. And so it's going to be a great time. We're starting the second week of January. I think it's January the 7th, I believe we're starting. For 21 days, we're going to have um, prayer every morning, Monday through Friday, right here at Cornerstone Church, 6 o'clock a.m., snow or shine. And we're going to broadcast it live so you can also come on and join us in prayer. We're going to just take an opportunity to set first and give God the best part of our year, the first part of our year. And when you give God the first, He blesses the rest. So this is something we're doing. And there's something else I want to encourage you about. I want to encourage you to pray about that. Breaking up fallow ground, the Bible says, and prepare yourself and let God do something new in your life, everybody. Amen? Well, let's all stand if we could as we're, oh, we're almost done with the offering. I'll give you guys an opportunity. Let's just all stand and have our closing prayer. And then we're going to wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And we're going to have our, our prayer team up. You don't want to miss next week. We have a special treat for you next week on Sunday. You don't want to miss it. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but you're going to be really pleased. That's next Sunday. It's a special gift for everybody. It's going to be coming. So we're going to be doing that. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for Christmas. Father, I pray you would turn the pressure into peace. Father, that we would dwell and expect great things from you, Lord God. I thank you for this place. I thank you for Christmas. And I thank you that we're more than overcomers in Christ Jesus. I pray a blessing in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Listen, we're going to open the front. If you need prayer, some of our prayer team come down. Otherwise, Merry Christmas, guys. God bless you.